Good afternoon, everyone. So how did y'all feel about last last Friday's test? Not that bad, right? Like, I think the average was about an 81, which is right at where I expected it to be, to be honest, um, with a high of 100 and a low of a 33. So for the most part, y'all did really well. Um, just a quick reminder that if you had an excused reason for not being here on Friday, either in person or taking the test online, you need to show me documented reasons why, and then we'll sort all that stuff out from there. So if you have a legit reason for not being here on Friday or taking the test online Friday, show me those documents and we'll work with it. All right. Just our general class reminders. Um, general or quiz eight is due the Sunday, typical time, typical setup. Y'all know the drill at this point. Uh, there's only like uh, six more after this one, so not too bad. Do remember that two of them do get dropped. So if you miss one, it's not the end of the world, but try to avoid that if you can, because you'd rather save that space or if you screw up one massively than if you just for laziness, you know? Um, also, our second with, uh, connecting with biology assignment is going to be due on November 1st, and it just opened up to y'all today. So I want to kind of go through that and explain exactly what that assignment is. For those of y'all that did the extra credit for exam two, you're going to have a leg up on everybody else. And the reason for that is you're going to be using the same exact platform. You're just going to have to go out and do a very specific set of circumstances for looking for things. It's really not that bad. So with your second connecting with biology assignment, you guys are going to go out into the Arboretum and you're going to hike one of the trails out there. It doesn't matter which trail. It can be as short or as long as you want. But ultimately, by the time you're done, you need to observe at least 15 organisms. Keep in mind that, you know, anything, whether it be insects, plants, whatever, is fair game. However, specifically, you have to observe at least 10 plants or fungi. That part is really easy to do. Honestly, you could stop at every bush and probably be fine. Um, and you need to observe at least five animals. Do remember that it's not just vertebrates, right? It's not just birds. It's not just mammals. You're allowed to include things like frogs, lizards, um, insects that are crawling on the ground. Look for things like um, little ant mounds and things. Those are all fair game. As well as you don't have to visibly observe something. If you find scat, so animal shit, on the trail somewhere, you're more than allowed, allowed to like post that as a sign that there is an animal here. That counts. Same thing with things like gopher tortoise burrows. If you find a gopher tortoise burrow, even if you don't find the tortoise, that counts as an animal towards your assignment. Now, ultimately, what you're going to have to do then is identify at least down to a very bare bones basics version of things, whether it be a mammal, a reptile, an amphibian, a bryophyte, a angiosperm, a gymnosperm, and you're gonna learn what all of those terms mean by the end, of this, uh, the end of this unit. And all of them are just different categories of animals and we'll talk about it more towards the end of the, uh, this unit. I assure you it's before this is due. And as always, you'll have to make sure you're uploading these on iNaturalist so we can verify what they are. And uh, that you'll also need to join that UCF BSC 1005 Fall 21 group. Remember that you don't have to physically add your observations once you've done that. It'll do it for you. So don't freak out if it's not like automatically or if it's not like letting you select it. It should automatically upload a report for you anytime you join that project. All right. Um, ultimately, what you're going to have to do, though, is you're going to have to turn in a Word document with a map of the Arboretum with where your observations were as well as the day you did your walk, the time you did your walk, and the weather conditions. And all of that information is really important because what we're going to do is we're going to, one, take all this information, we're going to gather it up, and we're going to use it to basically send an information report to the UCF Arboretum and be like, hey, here's all the biodiversity that this class found just by hiking these trails. Super important information. It'll help them out a lot, especially when it comes to they do a lot of fire management out there and it's really helpful to kind of see what's showing up and what plots and all that kind of thing as well as we'll be able to look at well if you're out there and it's like kind of rainy and a little cloudy you're going to see more things like toads or frogs hopping around versus if you're out there and it's bright and sunny you might get to pretty much only see insects so just keep some of that stuff in mind um but ultimately you have a month to do this i had katie try it out for us she said she did it in 20 minutes but by the time she walked the Arboretum and moved up and then uploaded everything. It took her 20 minutes. So it's not hard. It's just a little bit of effort. All right. 
So let me just show you what these trails are. There's a couple of smaller ones, like there's this really cool cypress stone trail that you can actually get down into the marsh. Uh, there's this tiny flatwoods trail that's around here. Uh, it's called the fire loop. Over here, there's a bunch of uh, pitcher plants and other uh, carnivorous plants that are really cool to check out. There's a lot of cool stuff out here. Some of these are shorter hikes than others, so keep that in mind. Um, if for some reason you cannot do this for accessibility reasons, like you're just not able to walk that far or something like that, we'll try to figure out something where it will be a little more conducive. Those of you that are having to take this class more hybrid than anything else, if you can't get back to Orlando, we'll try to find another similar place for you to do this way. You'll still have to do something similar, but it may just be at a state park near you instead of here on campus. And finally, this is what you're actually going to print. So your name on top, the number of observations, so six animals, 10 plants, right? The date and time of observations, the trail you walk, the conditions that you were outside for. Here's a quick <clears> zoom <throat> in of the map, and you can see where all these little orange dots are my animals, where all my blue dots are my plants. And then finally, your actual observations itself, where I'm categorizing. So I've got a Cuban tree frog, it's an amphibian. I've got a greenhouse frog, it's an amphibian. That's ultimately what I'm looking for. Yes. So it's in the project. So what you do is pull up iNaturalist. Let me just do it on here real quick. But it's really not that bad. It takes two seconds. Um, let me adjust that real quick. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> Used to work a little bit better than this. Maybe turn the brightness down your phone a little bit. There's some way I can. There we go. Perfect. Better than at least Billy Twice. Nope. <laughs> yeah, so just come talk to me after class and I'll show you. It'll be faster than trying to do it on here. All right. But it is really important to make sure you're following this template because I'm going to have Katie go through and input all of this information into a Google Doc. So that way you can do things like search based off of times and based off of weather, what certain organisms will show up in certain places. And I'll show you how all that information can be used for a much bigger scale project. Because this is kind of something that we're doing here that we're going to eventually branch off and do some really cool stuff with based later on in the semester. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So you do need to try to get it as close as humanly possible. What's nice is um, when you open up iNaturalist, you can basically filter it out on your computer to just show you your observations in a specific location. And you can just do a screenshot of that image. You don't have to like sit there and plot them out individually like I did. I show an example of that in the uh, rubric as well as the example turn in that is on web courses already. All right, yes. Um, you are allowed to go out in groups, but my one caveat is y'all can't observe the same exact thing. So if you're doing it together, maybe you can stand and look at one plant and the other one or the other person can stand and look at another plant, but it makes it a little bit more difficult when it comes to animals, I'll warn you. Um, but to be honest with you, if you go out in the mornings, especially, and you walk that fire trail, there's a spot that runs right up against that large reservoir that's right at the base of the arboretum near the pavilion. You'll at least see three to four different species of birds there. That'll, that's pretty easy to knock out. So, including federally endangered species and everything. It's really cool. Yes. So, you said um, we can take pictures of the locations like differently so we can see that the weather like springs on. Yeah. Is that yeah. So, um, let me show you. I'll pull up a different version of this. But yeah, there, there's different ways you can do this. I think the easiest way is probably just there's a screenshot you can take on the iNaturalist webpage that will just be the image itself of like the map. And that, that'll be sufficient. Let me see if I can find it real quick. It's taking forever to look today. So here I just took a screenshot of where 
Uh, so, so for instance, this is the entrance here. We're going to hear uh, here's that fire loop. You can just take that screenshot right off of my naturalist website. And it looks fine. It puts all those pictures or places where all of your observations are, so it doesn't require all that much extra effort. All right. Any other quick questions? Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If anything, find more. But the 15 is what's required. Um, and I think, it, yes. Not yet. So keep in mind that this assignment is separate from the extra credit, but um, something I won't be able to post the extra credit because I'm still waiting for about five or 10 more tests to come back to me between SAS as well as I have to regrade a couple because of issues with the Scantron machine reader. So as soon as that's all done, it'll probably be like Friday before the final grades are total 100%. But honestly, just add 5% to whatever you have that's on there right now and you're fine. All right, any other questions? Sorry, is it 5% or like 5 points out of like 5%? 5%. So um, it would have been like two two questions essentially that like you would have got. Like you got a 95. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right, so let's actually go ahead and get started here. So today we're going to be entering our third unit, which is honestly a lot better than the last two that we've done. We're going to be talking about genetics and evolution. This is primarily what I study, so you're going to have a little bit of extra material outside of the book, so be kind of prepared for that. But I try to bring in some really cool uh, real world examples of a lot of this stuff to show you that not only is it a theory, but this is how we're actually practicing this kind of stuff. So what exactly is DNA? And we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but Simply, DNA is a molecule that is a type of nucleic acid. There's DNA and RNA, which are two different types of nucleic acid. DNA is kind of the backbone of everything. So all cells, at least uh, non-bacterium, are going to use DNA to store genetic information, which is what the cells need to produce the protein, right? you got to turn it from the DNA to an RNA strand into the actual protein itself. Now, this DNA has that classic double helix, which, to be honest, it's kind of interesting to think about. We didn't know this existed until 1955. Um, its discovery is a little bit complicated in the sense that um, while it's been formally given a credit to Watson and Crick, um, they may have formally described it, but they weren't the only individuals involved with it. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, you can see up in the front there, uh, she is one of the people that was actually primarily there and described it initially. And some of her work was then kind of adapted by Watson and Crick to kind of get to that final answer. So it's not 100% just copying things down, but there was there's a little bit of nuance to it. But yes, there's some issues here. Um, so, but she was the one that actually developed the X-ray or technology to be able to get this image of how this actually looks. Now, ultimately, DNA is composed of nucleotides, right? Thinking back to uh, when we talked about amino acids and proteins and all that kind of fun stuff. You had the very basic monomer and then you bind it together to create a polymer, right? Well, these amino acids are that, are that basic form of DNA or RNA. And so there are three parts of this nucleotide. You've got the phosphate group over here. You have the actual sugar, which is where that deoxyribose, that DNA comes from, that D and DNA. Then you have that nitrogen base. Now that nitrogen's base, its shape and its structure is going to depend on what kind of nitro or, uh, nucleotide it is. So if you're talking about a DNA molecule, you'll have one of four options, adenine, guanine, um, thymine, and cytosine. If it's an RNA, instead of uh, that thymine, you're going to have something called uracil. So it's, it's basically acting in the same way, it's just slightly different. And ultimately, you have when it pairs up on DNA, you have A's and T's and C's and G's work together. Now, ultimately, all these nucleotides are going to form together and be bound together to create that strand of DNA. So you've got one strand that's a bunch of nucleotides, and then a partner strand that's going to be the complementing pair. So you have an A on one side, you can have a T on the other. 
These specialized covalent bonds are going to be there to join those nucleotides in a chain called DNA strands. And each DNA molecule is made up of two different strands of nucleotides. And these two strands will wind together to get that double helix shape that you think of when you think of DNA. Now, these strands run in parallel to each other. And what that means is basically from one direction to the other, they're basically going to be exactly the opposite of each other. So if you have a T, you're going to end up with a C on the other side. And there's a very specific reason for all of that. Now, two strands are aligned parallel to each other, but they're oriented in the opposite direction. And so it becomes really important when you're talking about DNA, are you talking about from the five prime to the three prime or the three prime to the five prime? And you'll see that terminology thrown around a little bit. And all that means is you're describing what direction you're reading the DNA from. Because it's not like a book or letters, you can read it from either way. Now, usually you have that northbound and that southbound side of it. So basically you've got the, from the five prime to the three prime, and from the three prime to the five prime. So each of these DNA strands are going to be complement to each other. Like I've already mentioned, if you've got a G on one strand, you're going to end up with a C on the other. If you've got a T on one strand, you're going to end up with an A on the other. These nitrogen bases of one DNA strand form these hydrogen bonds with the nitrogen bases on the other DNA strand, which is what hold these two strands together. Now remember, hydrogen bonds aren't that strong of a bond. And so things like heat and pressure can break those bonds temporarily, which will be useful when we're talking about how do we make more of this DNA, right? Ultimately, just remember that A is always going to pair with T, and C is always going to pair with G. Now, because of this complementary base pairing, the sequence of each DNA strand determines the sequence of the other. So in other words, if you only have one strand, you can figure out exactly what's supposed to be on the other side, and vice versa. And that's, again, really useful if you want to make sure that you're getting the same thing over and over and over again, then you have to replicate it. Now, ultimately, when we think of this double-stranded DNA, this is kind of the most loosely formed version of it. And more often than not, when it's inside of your genetic or inside of your cells, it's going to be much more bound together. So ultimately, this DNA is wound up into what we call chromosomes. And each of these chromosomes is a discrete package of DNA coiled around proteins. And how those proteins bind it together can influence what areas of DNA get expressed. So not only is it just, hey, this is what I have, but if you've got it bound up to where it can't be accessed, that DNA area, that section of DNA can't be used. And so that part becomes really important. Now, if you were to unwind DNA, it would be way too long to fit into the cell. So you have to form it into these chromosomes. Now, one thing I do want to point out that when you see this classic form of a chromosome, that's where it's still paired. So you have two copies of that genome that are present in that single chromosome. Ultimately, this leads us back to this thing I keep on mentioning called the central dogma of biology. Everything in biology flows from the simple explanation of things. So in cells, you have the genetic information. And it's going to go from DNA, which is that blueprint. It's going to be the cookbook, right? You're going to have RNA, which is a specific recipe. And then you have protein, which is the actual food that you made. Hopefully that makes sense. And so you have to go through this process of transcription, which is where you're taking, you're basically photocopying that single recipe out of your cookbook. And then translation, which is when you're taking that RNA that we now have, which is your recipe, right? And you're turning it into the actual food that you're wanting to make. That's that translation aspect of it. We'll get more into what those specifically mean here in a minute. But ultimately, protein production is going to start with the DNA. So you've got a gene, which is a small region on the chromosome. So it's just a section of DNA, right? And a sequence of DNA in each gene codes a specific protein. So for instance, um, but the thing is that not, not only do you need that DNA to get to that protein, you're going to need RNA. That's that recipe that we're talking about. You're not just got that master cookbook. You have to get it to where it's digestible and workable. So RNA is also another nucleic acid that participates in protein synthesis. And there's a lot of organisms that entirely rely on RNA. In fact, there's certain, I believe, bacterium, as well as a number of viruses, even though they're not technically living, that exclusively rely on RNA. Now, RNA is single-stranded, 
And instead of binding, it's going to have something called uracil. And the big difference here is in DNA, you have something called deoxyribose, the main sugar molecule. Well, if you're in um, RNA, it's going to gain an extra oxygen here, so it's going to become ribose. That's where the R in RNA comes from. Now, there's three different kinds of RNA. Each of these different types of RNA interact with each other to synthesize proteins during translation. So you have messenger RNA or mRNA. As I'm sure you're very aware of, the COVID vaccine that you hear of about um, Moderna and Pfizer are both mRNA vaccines, right? That's what you're actually putting into your body. It has nothing to do with the actual virus itself. And what this does is it carries that information that specifies a particular protein and it is essentially a copy of information stored in the DNA. That's that photocopy of the recipe out of the cookbook. Then you're going to have your transfer RNA. These molecules are what we call connectors. They're going to carry each amino acid to the correct spot that's going to bind it onto the uh, mRNA molecule. But then ultimately, you're going to have your ribosomal RNA or rRNA, which is part of the ribosome that's going to be there to basically have translation occur. Ultimately, a gene is like the recipe in a cookbook. You know, the instructions are in the DNA. That's the genome that determines what pr proteins the cell can produce overall. You have the cell then uses that DNA to synthesize that RNA, which is transcription. In other words, instead of just pulling and looking at every single protein possible, you're pulling just one of them out. That's a single recipe. And finally, you're using that RNA and its genetic information to synthesize the protein. That's the actual cooking process. Now, that DNA is going to provide the recipe for every protein. So, in other words, somewhere in your genome, you have a, about a couple thousand different genes that code for a bunch of different things. And some of those you're going to need every single day. And some of those you may need only once in your lifetime. But you need to still have access to them and use them at different parts of your life, right? So, that's why you need to have all of those there nice and discreetly stored. And depending on what you need and how often you need it, it'll be either more, more bound or more or less bound and all that kind of other fun stuff. This transcription is going to then take DNA and create RNA. So basically it's a set of chemical reactions that occur in the nucleus, which is where you're actually going to form the RNA. And what it does is it basically uses the DNA as a template. It says, I want this specific gene, and it's going to bind that single strand of RNA as it builds it on top of it to match the exact version that's found in the gene and in the DNA itself. And then it, it, what's going to ultimately happen here is then you're going to transcribe that. So basically that DNA is what determines that RNA sequence. So for instance, if you've got a piece of DNA and as it's building RNA on top of it, you have an A, you're going to get a G, or sorry, a U. U in this place is in the place of a T in this situation, right? Because it's a it's not the end. If you've got a C, it's going to turn into a G. If you've got a G, it's going to turn into a C. If you've got a T, it's going to turn into an A. And here you can actually see how this works. So here you have some sort of RNA polymerase enzyme. It's going to bind to the DNA strand. It's then going to start building this RNA molecule coming off of that initial template DNA strand. Ultimately, when it's done, it's going to break off and it's just going to remove just what it needs in that RNA and the DNA is going to go back to the re coming back together. This occurs in three steps called initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation is where that protein is going to bind to that DNA strand. Elongation is when it's actually going to assemble that RNA strand on top of the DNA template. And then termination is when that RNA protein or the protein is going to come off, that RNA strand is going to separate, and the DNA is going to be wound back together. Here it's a little bit more detailed. So at the beginning of a specific gene, you're going to have something called the promoter. That's basically saying, hey, here's where you need to bind. And an enzyme called RNA polymerase is going to unwind the DNA double helix so it can then bind to the DNA itself. So only one strand called the DNA template is used when transcribing an RNA molecule, right? You don't need both of them. They're the exact same thing, relatively speaking. You're just reading them from different directions. So you only need one side of it. And that other DNA strand is not going to participate in transcription at all. 
You're then going to get to the elongation step, which is where that RNA polymerase is going to move along the template strand of DNA. And it's going to make an RNA copy. So every T it's going to come across, it's going to put, put an A down for the RNA molecule, that sort of thing. It's a complementary strand. So basically, whatever you have in the, the DNA, it's going to be the complementary version of it. Then this RNA polymerase is going to join the RNA nucleotides together into that RNA strand with each RNA nucleotide base pair with each template strand, matching exactly. Ultimately, when this transcription uh, protein is going to reach a specific point called the terminator, it's going to release from the DNA. It's going to release that RNA transcription that we now have kind of off on its own, and it's going to rewind the DNA itself. So ultimately, the cell produced a copy of its RNA gene, an RNA copy of its gene that is a complementary version of what's present in the DNA. And, at, and it was all based off of where that promoter was and where that terminator was. And ultimately, at the end, the DNA goes back to the way it was. So in eukaryotes, you know, things like vertebrates, animals, plants, whatever, uh, RNA processing takes place in the nucleus. And once transcription is complete, um, it's going to move out of the nucleus itself. Those RNA molecules are going to be that. But in prokaryotes, like bacteria or archaea, RNA can participate in translation right away because there, there's no true nucleus, right? It's all just kind of bound and floating in the cytoplasm. So in eukaryotic cells, the RNA has to undergo chemical alterations and then leave the nucleus before that translation can start. So even though you've created that RNA molecule, you still have to get it to the ribosomes outside of that nucleus itself. So to do this, you have something called RNA processing, which is going to attach what we call a cap and a tail. Pretty straightforward of where those are going to go. That cap structure is going to be added to the five prime end, and a poly A tail is going to be added to the three prime end of the RNA. And this cap and tail is there to protect the mRNA from degradation. So you're not losing the important bits. You have kind of this excess junk nucleotides that are going to protect it from breaking apart. Now, during RNA processing, you're also going to remove something called introns. Now, introns are sections within the uh, sequence itself that are not used to produce a protein. This is really important when you're talking about things like the immune genes that generate antibodies. What introns you cut out and which ones you leave can massively change how that antibody is going to be shaped and the protein structure of it itself. So additionally, you have something called exons, which are the sequences that are there to specify the specific amino acids. Those are what we are primarily interested in. Yes, the introns are there, but the exons are what we're primarily interested in actually turning into a protein. And ultimately, during processing, those introns are going to be removed. Once that process RNA is ready, it's going to be shipped out as a functional molecule, and it's going to leave the nucleus where it will then bind to a ribosome so that translation can occur. Now, in translation, that's where you're going to take that mRNA and use it to build a protein. So now that you've taken this DNA, you've converted it into mRNA through that translation process. Now you're going to, or sorry, in transcription process, now you're going to translate it into the protein itself. Now, ultimately, all cells are going to have the same genetic code. So a codon is a set of three nucleotides that are going to encode a single uh, amino acid. So all the life on Earth has the exact same results given to them. If you have an A, or sorry, a C, C, and a C, it's going to have a codon that's going to bind between A, A, G. That's going to always give you light C. That's how usually it works. There's always weird exemptions for things, so bear with me on that one. But, and here you can actually see a general breakdown of what all these things do. So, for instance, if you have this, is where it shows you the specific genetic code that's going to code for what on mRNA and what it corresponds with for amino acids. In other words, if you have a UUU or a UUC, it's going to give you uh, this metal lining where you can end up with a stop code on over here, which is a UAA or UAB. All these different things relate to different things when it comes to what kind of amino acids are going to be used in that protein synthesis, as well as um, whether or not you're going to stop or start in that specific spot. Yeah. No, you will not need to memorize that chart. Don't worry about that. 
If I give you a question on translation, which is entirely possible, I would give you that chart because nobody actually memorizes that. Ultimately, that mRNA is going to code for the protein. So you have that tRNA adapter, which is what's going to actually have these amino acids on them. So in this case, it would be AAA. That's what's actually going to be the tRNA. And that's why it's binding specifically at that stop. And ultimately, that tRNA adapter is going to recognize those mRNA codons, that little three, set of three nucleotides, and it's going to bind to it and attach that amino acid. So stop codon literally just means that that's where the protein goes to the stops. That's all it is. Yeah, exactly. So say, for instance, you have six codons, but you have four that give you something, either an anime or some sort of amino acid that you see up here. If at the fifth one, you have something that says UAA, it's going to stop synthesis, even though you have additional codons in the end. You also have something called the start codon, which is where it's telling the uh, amino acid where you're actually going to start building that protein. It's pretty simple. Basically, at the start codon, that's going to be the, the point where the codons are actually going to start getting red, and the stop codon is when they stop getting red. The uh, tRNA is going to translate that genetic code and ultimately it's going to bring those amino acids to the ribosome. The, the tRNA binder or adapters are going to recognize that genetic code and are going to bind each amino acid together. Now, each tRNA has a different anti codon that base pairs with the codon in the mRNA. Those were, that was that chart that we kind of explained a little bit ago. Ultimately, this translation requires ribosomes. So ribosomes are made of proteins and rRNA, and they're to help to kind of the three different types of RNAs interact with each other to actually build that protein itself. So each ribosome has two parts, a small subunit and a large subunit. And here in the small subunit is where you're actually going to bind that mRNA to, whereas that large ribosomal subunit is going to be there where it's actually assembling things. Just to break that down a little bit more, you're going to have that small ribosomal subunit that's going to bind to the mRNA. The large ribosomal subunit is going to bind to the tRNA and allow those two things to interact with each other and actually form that protein from during that synthesis process. Ultimately, translation is going to build that protein, right? So translation takes place in three steps. You have the initiation, the elongation, and the termination, just like transcription. That initiation is going to occur at that start codon that you mentioned, whereas that termination is going to end up at the stop codon. Ultimately, those mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomes are going to work together to link those amino acids into a chain and then dissociate again. So basically, they're going to come together. Based off of the codons that are present, they're going to bind the anticodons from that tRNA. And then ultimately, it's going to bind together the amino acids that are on the outside of that tRNA together. And when it hits that stop codon, it'll say, OK, we're done. It'll release that mRNA, and it'll have that protein. So here, you can see that initiation step. So first, you're going to begin with translation with mRNA is going to bind to that small sub subunit. You're going to have that um, initiator tRNA is going to bind to the mRNA, and this anticodon is going to match up with the first mRNA. <clears throat> so here you have that UAC, that's that start codon. It's going to be, you have this net amino acid. That's what's going to trigger that large subunit to actually come up and attach the rest of it. So then you're going to get that binding of that large subunit which is going to make that um, small subunit to complete that initiation. Now, ultimately, these amino acids are going to be positioned directly next to each other in the line, and they're going to build a, uh, basically that high, uh, dehydration synthesis is going to be happening right here as you assemble those amino acids next to each other. So ultimately, you've got that peptide binding there. And again, this is all driven by enzymes in the larger ribosomal subunit, which is going to be there to join those different amino acids together using that, creating that polypeptide bond that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. Ultimately, the ribosome is going to move to the next codon and to the next codon and to the next codon through that process called elongation. It's basically going to just keep building on top of itself. And ultimately, at termination, you're going to have a stop codon, which in this case is UAA. That ribosome is going to reach that stop codon, which is at the end of that mRNA, 
Not always, though. Um, and that protein is then going to help the release factor is going to bind to that stop codon. And since there's no tRNA that can bind there, no more amino acids will be added. So basically, what it does is it stops it right after the slap codon. You have the slap codon comes in and it blocks it from being able to add any more amino acids. And so that should probably test that the control. Ultimately, then you have your protein synthesis as complete. This polypeptide is going to detach from the mRNA and it's going to fold into a functional protein. Because remember, those amino acids, it's not just what's there, it's how they're shaped and how, as they kind of move together, and they're going to have various bonds to, towards each other and create this like very weird folded structure. They're going to have tertiary and quaternary different structures depending on how it's shaped and what molecules are in a specific spot. There's entire, you know, labs, all they do is they focus on how a specific amino acid will cause the shaping of a protein to change. So don't, I don't expect you to know that specifically. The translation is efficient. You can have multiple ribosomes all attaching to a single mRNA molecule simultaneously so the cell can make as many molecules of protein all at once. It's not just a single one at a time. And ultimately, this whole process is going to allow your cells to express specific genes as the proteins that they need. So you have the gene expression, which is where you synthesize the RNA and then into a protein, and the cells will only express the genes that they need to use. For example, your red blood cells are going to express hemoglobin, but your pancreas cells are going to express insulin. And all of that is based off of what cells are being actively told to produce at that time. And there's a lot of different ways you can trigger this to turn it on and off. It can be heavily environmentally dependent, as well as very genetically controlled based off of what kind of cell you are. In fact, there's entire fields of study where all they do is they take a genetic sample from, say, a frog or a snake or what have you, and they extract as much RNA as they possibly can. And then what they do is they match that RNA based off of the type of gene that it encodes, so you can predict Oh, say if this animal is sick, how is its immune system responding based off the immune genes that are showing up in that profile of that animal? It's really cool stuff. It's a pain in the ass to actually execute because RNA degrades so quickly and it's pretty useless, honestly, outside of the cell, but it's still really cool. Now, the cells can regulate this gene expression through a variety of different mechanisms. Obviously, in order to save energy, you don't need to be constantly reproducing or producing these proteins if you don't need them. The cells are going to save energy by only producing the needed proteins. Only need what you need, right? And ultimately, all cells are going to regulate gene expression, but in different ways. Now, all cells have a way to control the rate and the timing of transcription. So not only how much of it you're producing, but how often you're producing it. How many copies of that mRNA are you taking out of your DNA? Now, you carry out cells specifically can also control the rate and the timing of translation, too. Prokaryotes can't do this, but eukaryotes can. And again, this is related to the whole fact that prokaryotes, remember, they don't have a nucleus, right? It's all just kind of free floating in the ribosome. So it's a lot harder to control and specifically kind of tamp down once you've released the mRNA into the kind of cell itself. Whereas with trans, uh, with eukaryotes, all that's bound up in the nucleus, and the, you have to wait for that mRNA to be processed and then released into the cytoplasm to attach to the ribosomes. Now, prokaryotes can actually regulate the transcription of several genes at once. So in prokaryotes, they organize into what we call operons, which are groups of genes that are always transcribed together. So for instance, in this case, you have a promoter going to trigger that production of that mRNA there. You're going to have that operon, which is then going to bind all of these genes together. Then you're going to have that terminator. And so for instance, here you have that lac operon, which includes three genes that are going to encode lactose digesting enzymes. Now, also in bacteria, you have something called repressor proteins. These are there to block transcription. So say, for instance, when lactose is present, or sorry, when lactose is absent, rather, um, you have the lactose digesting enzymes are not going to be needed, right? There's just excess waste that that cell produced it doesn't need. So what the cell is going to be doing is including that repressor protein, so that way that mRNA doesn't get transcribed. So that repressor protein is going to bind to the DNA and block the RNA polymerase preventing any transcription to happen. 
Here you can basically see where that compression protein is. It's basically just sitting here keeping it from happening. Now, say what if you were, if this bacterial cell was to come in contact with lactose, that lactose presence is going to simply remove the refractive protein. This is something you can do a lot easier in prokaryotes because, again, it's kind of a single cell. A lot of things are all kind of intermingling inside of the cell itself. You don't have a true nucleus. And so if a lactose molecule is present in that cell, it's going to release that repressor protein and basically uh, cause that area of the DNA to then become replicated or transcribed. So that lactose digesting enzyme is going to be produced during translation. Now, like I've already kind of mentioned, DNA packaging also can heavily regulate the gene expression. So not only do you have specific segments of the DNA that promote or, or you know, stop specific parts of the DNA from being replicated and being transcribed, you have how tightly and how loosely it's bound can dramatically affect this as well. So if it's all tightly packaged up, right? You can't exactly get access to it. Kind of like if you've ever had to put a bunch of stuff into a storage unit, it's just a pain in the ass to go get that shit out, right? It's the same kind of thing that's happening in the DNA. So in eukaryotes, the gene regulation is going to start in the nucleus. And some of these are going to be wound up so tightly that they cannot be used for transcription. And thus, other genes are going to have to be available. You're then going to have something called transcription factors, which are also there to regulate gene expression. In eukaryotes, you have many different forms of these proteins. Um, and ultimately, this affects the activity of the RNA polymerase, altering the rate of transcription. Then you can regulate things at that RNA processing step. So in eukaryotic cells, we use different combinations of exons, which cause alternate splicing. And this creates different proteins from the same mRNA. And like I mentioned, this is really useful when you're trying to make a bunch of different copies of things using the same general pattern. Very, very helpful when it comes to the immune system. And then you have that RNA export step, which also can, you can use to regulate this gene expression. So certain eukaryotic proteins will only hold mRNA inside of the nucleus and thus preventing them from reaching that ribosome. Furthermore, once you get it out of the nucleus, you have RNA degradation. Yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. So we'll talk more about why that specifically happens, but that usually has more to do with the types of uh, alleles that you have present. So each gene, you have two different versions of it usually, an A and a B form, if you will. Sometimes you'll have both of that A form or both of that B form. Sometimes you'll have a mix of them, and sometimes you'll only, you'll have kind of just a single version of it. And we'll talk about how that all breaks down, but ultimately that's usually what describes whether or not you're gonna have some sort of genetic abnormality. Yeah, that RNA degradation is going to actually help to regulate gene expression as well. So some mRNA is not going to be able to be processed because it's going to be so quickly degraded the second it leaves the nucleus and just useless. So ultimately, other mRNA are going to be much more long-lived, are going to be able to trans be translated a lot more often in the pro into proteins because they're able to stick around and hang out inside of that cytoplasm, whereas the other kind just degraded too quickly and it just kind of died out very quickly. Then you're going to have that protein activity, which is going to regulate the gene expression. So some proteins are more stable, while others are degraded very quickly. Moreover, in order to function, a protein must be folded properly and reach the correct cellular location, both external inside of the cell, as well as once it's released outside of the cell. The mutations are changes in the DNA. For instance, in this specific example with fruit flies, you have a mutation that caused the location of uh, growth for legs to change onto the face of the fly and actually replace where its antenna should be. And this is actually a fairly simple change. All it requires is a single gene to be slightly altered, and you can completely change the entire morphology of this animal. In fact, there's a really great um, documentary that I believe is on Discovery Channel that shows where you're actually just by turning on and off a couple of genes able to grow, have chickens that grow like full length tails, almost looking like dinosaurs. And as a result, they walk very differently, which is kind of cool. But it's amazing how just simple, slight changes like this can completely change your entire body form. Now, there's a couple of different types of mutations. So you have things like point mutations, which are only going to change the DNA slightly. And these are simple um, 
change is usually just in what codon shows up at a particular protein. So for instance, um, you can have substitution mutations where it's something simple as if you had an original sentence that said that one big fly had one red eye, instead of E there, you have a Q for whatever reason. And it doesn't necessarily always you know, cause something to not happen the proper way. You may have what we call a silent mutation, which is where uh, the mutation doesn't actually manifest anything as a result just because it's still coding for that same code on. So in this specific example, you have what we call substitution mutation, which is where it changes only one base pair in a single gene. And only one codon is altered, so only one amino acid in that protein is going to be affected. And that protein may or may not retain its ability to function. It just kind of depends. You then have something called a frame shift mutation, which is where you have a nucleotide insertion, and it changes only the base pair in a gene, but alters many codons as well. Basically, if you add one extra letter in there, it's going to jumble up everything because it's going to move everything back. So in this case, a large portion of the protein is going to be affected. And the protein is unlikely to retain its ability to function, or it may gain a new function. It just kind of depends. Now, some of these mutations can cause disease. But again, I do want to caution you to think that not all mutations cause disease and problems. Very few actually do. But in order to see a difference, usually when it comes to mutations, it's pretty drastic. So here you have a single base substitution of the hemoglobin gene that causes blood cells to form abnormally, leading to sickle cell. Basically, it kind of reshapes the structure of the proteins inside of the blood cell and allows it to give that more kind of sickly blood cell looking shape to it because it doesn't have as much hemoglobin and doesn't process things as well as it should. So what ultimately causes these mutations? Some of these are spontaneous and form from errors in the DNA replication. Others are caused by things called mutagens, which are external agents that change DNA structure, things like chemicals, radiation, x-rays, that sort of thing. Um, but there's a lot of different things that can do this. All right. So I know we have like 20 more slides, but I think we're just going to go ahead and call it a day here because it's too much to get through in three minutes. So do you remember, go ahead and get started working on that connecting with biology assignment. It doesn't take long to do, but you don't want to wait for now, wait a month to do it. I don't remember off the top of my head, to be honest with you. There was some sort of, it was some sort of dinosaur looking at how you could, it's kind of like refuting Jurassic Park and why the, type, uh, the way they described replicating dinosaurs would work. But you could potentially, in theory, take birds and turn on specific genes and get a dinosaur approximate-ish, but not actually a dinosaur itself. It's neat.